So first of all, um, I, we're going to do self-introductions, and they're going to be super brief because we have a little moment for a statement a little bit later. So um, I'm going to start. My name is Denise Cooper. I'm the Vice President of Special Initiatives for a company called Nearform Limited, which is in Ireland, and I have about 21 years as a full-time open source activist. So, uh, Demetrius, how about you go next? Thank you, Denise. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone. I am Demetrius Cheatham. My preferred pronouns are she and hers, and I am the Senior Director for Diversity and Inclusion and Belonging at GitHub. Thank you. And Endu? Hi, um, I'm Endu Emuche, IBM Fellow, Cloud Transformation and Engineering. Um, work at IBM, work with some of our largest clients around the world. And I'm leading the work around good tech for IBM. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And you're actually in Africa right now. Is that correct? I, I am in Africa right now. And I'll be coming home soon. Great. All right. And Wendy. Sure. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm Wendy John. I'm the head of global diversity and inclusion at Fidelity Investments. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and I'm joining you from the Research Triangle. So I'm in Durham, North Carolina. Thank you. I should have said that I'm in San Francisco and I always forget the pronoun thing. I am a she pronoun, the usual one. Boring, I know. Um, okay, so uh, let's do the, what is your company doing to increase DNI? and I? Um, I want five minutes per person and I wanna hear um, the top three outreach efforts or initiatives that you're doing and we're gonna do it in the order that I call you and I'm gonna call Endu first. Sure. Um, so on this particular topic, um, I think for, for me, the preamble is threefold. One, IBM recognizes that diversity and inclusion is good business. So that's number one. Number two is that um, progress in this area really does require all of us, all of us, bar none, working together um, as one in order to drive topics around diversity and inclusion. And then thirdly, transparency is critical. Uh, so with transparency, you can measure success, you can have a clear view of where you are versus where the aspirationally you want to be. And uh, that's the context in which I'll describe the three specific um, initiatives that we're driving at IBM. Number one is embrace social justice. So this is an umbrella um, initiative that really captures what we're doing around representation and transparency, what we're doing to lead in good tech. I spoke um, briefly about this during the keynote um, session this morning. Uh, thirdly, it's about creating economic opportunity, not just within IBM, but external beyond IBM. And then it's about social justice policy advocacy. Now, for example, actually reaching out to our legislators uh, such that we're able to uh, provide um, insight into how best to go about these policies and how those might actually affect um, the citizens. And then um, number two broadly is embrace learning, uh, which is really learning about these topics that are critical and actually quite urgent now. You know, how do we have individual learning journeys that can actually enhance our understanding of topics uh, related to diversity and inclusion? And then thirdly and broadly, it's about allyship. Uh, we know uh, that diversity inclusion requires everyone working shoulder to shoulder. So allyship becomes uh, critical. And then specifically um, in terms of what we do um, at IBM and what we've done over the last number of years. Um, recently, our CEO, Arvind Krishna, wrote to the US Congress outlining detailed policy proposals to advance racial equality. We had about 800 plus uh, IBMers actually use a grassroots tool uh, to send um, 2,300 or so letters to members of Congress really to have them come together in a bipartisan uh, way uh, in order to pass um, legislation that affects in a positive way diversity and inclusion. Number two, IBM has supported the passage of hate crimes legislation. For example, in Georgia, we expect the, the same legislation to pass in Arkansas in, in 2021. And then nearly a decade of, of work that IBM has done around a program we refer to as Pathways in Technology Early College High School, P 
P-Tech for short, actually builds pipeline even before professional um, sort of hiring occurs. So the P-Tech program, we have made a commitment of um, really graduating 10,000 um, P-Tech interns uh, by 2025. And then uh, recently in July this year, uh, we made a commitment, an announcement uh, to actually have a thousand paid uh, P-Tech graduates um, be um, really given jobs within IBM um, by 2021. These are just some examples that I will point out. Uh, and then there are quite a number of others which I will speak to uh, subsequently as part of this conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And, and before we go to the next one, I want to say that um, if you don't realize that lobbying is something that nonprofits cannot do, and most open source projects are nonprofits, we're not allowed to lobby politically, but corporations can um, through establishing PACs and in other ways and having direct outreach uh, and lobbying organizations that they fund. And it's hugely helpful to have alignment on that. That is one of the ways that open source won. And, and as you know, IBM was a big part of that. And so thank you for pushing this agenda because we need the lift and we can't do it from where we're sitting a lot of the time. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay, great. Let is, let's move along. And I think we'll do Dimitris next. By the way, you came in under and do. Thank you for that. All right, you ready? Let's go. Thank you so much. And I know that you asked for three, Denise, but I'm going to sneak in a fourth one, but I promise to stay under my five minutes. Uh, at Yuma Hub, we organize our uh, diversity and inclusion and belonging efforts under four pillars. That's people, platform, policy, and philanthropy. And so in our people initiatives, of course, we have measurable objectives around hiring, retention, and advancement. One in particular that I have to speak about because I'm new to this role, and GitHub requires that everyone that joins the company has to have a diversity, inclusion, and belonging interview as part of their interview process. And so in my work, that was so critical for me to see and to experience because as we all know, diversity, inclusion, and belonging is daunting work. It's highly rewarding, but it's also daunting. And so if you have a culture in which you allow everyone to come in and then it's our job to try and convince people that diversity and inclusion and belonging is important, that's really rolling a ball and pushing it up the hill. But if, at GitHub, we want to make sure that everyone that comes into our company already has that commitment to diversity, inclusion and belonging. And that's what the purpose of that diversity interview is as part of that interview process. The second pillar is around platform. Our vision at GitHub is to be the home for all developers. And what does that mean? That means that we want everyone that's on our platform, no matter who they are or where they are, to really know that they are safe and that they belong. And so how do we do that? We do that through many initiatives, but one in particular that we're especially proud of is that we recently changed all of our default branch naming from master to main. And we're working with our partners and all others in the Git community to do the same thing so that this becomes an industry-wide best practice, not just something that one or two companies do, but something that we all do. Our third pillar is policy. And Indu just spoke about some of the policy initiatives that they're doing at IBM. At GitHub, we have a strategy around tech inclusion. And so we make sure that we um, sign on to amicus briefs and advocate for policy issues that affect underrepresented individuals as well as communities who are diverse to make sure that they have a place in open source software as well. And so one particular amicus brief that we just signed on to this summer was the one that was affecting international students who were living and studying in the United States. We wanted to make sure that those students knew that they could you know, be safe here, that they could also work in the companies, they could work at GitHub, and they did not have to go back home to wherever their home country was, that we needed them here in our tech industry. And so we were proud to sign on to that amicus brief as well. And the fourth pillar is philanthropy. There's so much amazing work going on at GitHub and I'm pausing because I was trying to decide which ones that I wanted to talk about. 
GitHub matches up to $15,000 per employee to donate to any charitable organization of their choosing. If it's a 501c3 and our employees, they uh, make a contribution to that organization, GitHub will match that up to $15,000. They also allow an additional 40 hours annually for employees to actually go and work in charitable organizations of their choice. And not only are they giving them that time off, it does not have to go against their PTO, they will also make an hourly contribution to that organization as well for the time that they work there. This is something that we've seen has really increased the amount of philanthropy and volunteerism and giving to organizations that our employees are passionate about. And in addition to, the, and to our employees making those um, contributions, GitHub also donates to organizations that are important to our, our employees as well. This includes organizations that are working to fight racial injustice and um, racial inequality and social injustice. And this includes Black Lives Matter and Campaign Zero as well. So I, like I said, I snuck in four there, but hopefully I stayed in my time, Denise. Again with the muting. Um, yeah, you did very well. Thank you so much. And um, the, the, you got a lot of kudos when you mentioned the renaming. And I know that renaming was mentioned in keynote this morning as well. Um, I think that, that uh, it, it's a good time to take stock of all those kinds of, you know, old behaviors that have been lingering in the tech community for so long. And um, GitHub as the sort of the, the youngest company in this, this group, of course, is going to be the most forward pushy, you know. Um, the thing that I love about GitHub is um, when I go to conferences for you guys, you get to make your own Octocat. And your Octocats are very diverse. They, you know, you can, you, can, you can make your Octocat be anybody and you can be that person. And when I go to that conference, there are so many different people there that much broader audience than I have seen in 20 years of going to tech conferences. So I really appreciate the, the forward push that GitHub has made, both in the way that we work and in the kind of people that we are. So thank you very much for that. All right, Wendy, you are on uh, for your statement and I'm really looking forward to hearing it because I've been spending a lot of time around banks lately. So <laughs> tell me your stuff. Sure, no problem. Thank you so much. Um, so at Fidelity, we strive to build a workforce that celebrates and elevates employees of all backgrounds and all diversity. And so we, we do this uh, for two main reasons. We want to provide relevant experiences for our increasingly diverse customers. And we want to serve as an employer where people from all backgrounds can build dynamic, thriving careers as one of our over 45,000 employees. I myself have been at Fidelity for just over 23 and a half years. You know, I was born in the Caribbean. I was initially educated in Canada um, and I've lived in the US for over 25 years. So I bring a wealth of diverse experiences just even in my own journey. Um, and I've had the opportunity to have, you know, five or six already distinct roles with very different focus areas in my time at the firm. You know, we believe that taking a behaviors-based approach to change and insisting on accountability for all will help us to continue to drive that change. And so if you caught my keynote this morning, you heard me talk about our Simple Starts framework. And so that concept prompts our employees to make adjustments to their behaviors and the business processes that make up their day-to-day -day work. We feel that by focusing on behaviors within your immediate control, rather than trying to shift the entire organization's culture, which I think to Dimitri's point is, seems daunting, um, we see incremental changes that add up significantly over time. So in terms of the three distinct areas of inclusion and diversity that you asked about, I would say our first is increasing the diversity of our workforce by getting more diverse people in the door. And we try to do this by getting our employment opportunities in front of diverse communities through partnerships and targeted online advertising, um, as well as removing bias from the application and interview processes. But we know that we can't make progress through recruiting alone. So we also focus on developing the historically underrepresented talent that we already have at the firm, removing barriers and creating support systems for historically underrepresented employees. 
And that takes the form of a few different efforts. This year, we're pilot piloting several bespoke programs. So our LIFT program, which is a sponsorship program for black and brown leaders in the firm that assigns them a sponsor um, and they become a protege of that sponsor. And the sponsors are senior members and senior leaders in our firm. Aspire to Lead, which is a tandem learning experience and development experience where an individual, let's say more mid-career and their manager both go through a, an experience um, over several months. And we've heard already for many that we're going through this program, particularly earlier this year um, in June with, you know, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, that being in that program together really helped many of both the managers as well as the employees that were going through the program find a way to have a, a really courageous conversation about what was happening in the, in the broader community. And then we also have partnered with the Nook Online or now known as Kahila for custom women focused programs. And so we have tailored these programs to engage some of our underrepresented employees or women and people of color where we know that sponsorship and advocacy is, is really critical. And this is also where having employee resource groups and special interest groups add value. We have an incredibly engaged associate population with over 26,000 employees out of our 45,000 involved in one or more of, our, our, of these groups. And I'd say finally, as a customer obsessed organization, we know that our diverse people help us create customer value. The people we serve are incredibly diverse and more so than 70 plus years ago when, when Fidelity first started. And we always strive to create relevant experiences for them. So this means ensuring that our products and services resonate with all, not just the majority. So a great example of how we've done this in recent years is our Office of Customer Accessibility. In 2018, our Enable ERG, which focuses on those that are differently abled, proactive fact at Fidelity, we were not necessarily accustomed to think of disabilities as a dimension of our customers. But we knew that disabilities likely impact one in five Americans have a disability. So it stands to reason that of Fidelity's 30 plus million customers, about 20% might have a disability. In only seven months, the Enable ERG created and pitched a business case on what they believe to be an opportunity to strengthen our business and our customer offering. And the Office of Customer Accessibility or the OCA as we call it, a dedicated business unit to improve the customer experience for people with disabilities by ensuring accessibility is now a design principle in everything that we do. Since its inception, the OCA has been in instrumental in winning new business and retaining existing business. And for example, to deepen our relationship with existing clients, we often share best practices to help them em enhance their own accessibility and disability inclusion. And we strategize with them on reducing their unemployment rate for qualified candidates with disabilities. So the OCA has often played a role in the process when we bring in new customers. And we found this to be really critical for, for some of our customers, even as they consider their own position on DNI as a prominent factor in how they do business. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Okay, well, we have some some um, chatting going on already around this topic, and people people uh, really are appreciating some of what they're hearing, and also people starting to ask questions already. We are going to get to audience questions, so if you have more questions for these folks, by all means, bring them up, and and I'll get to them. I promise. But in the near term, we have a plan for what to talk about next to get this started. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about big wins. And um, we're going to do it a little sort of piecemeal because you guys just outlined some of it. So I'm going to ask some of the questions about those wins. So um, so as to bring them up. And if one of the other panelists has something that they want to say while that's going on, they can indicate just like people do, because um, there are only four of us. So we should be able to pull it off that way. So uh, starting out, I'm really interested in this PTAC initiative and do. Um, so the, uh, what I'm curious about is if you're the, the 
the effects that you're seeing in people that are not going to go through classical education paths, um, most of the best engineers that I know, uh, well, many of the best engineers that I know did not go to CS school. But I know that as the industry crystallizes, that will become less and less common. And um, we're pushing people through these boot camps and creating almost uh, dual citizenship, if you know what I'm saying. There's the people that are scientists and there's everybody else. And my, my Wikipedia page says I'm a computer scientist, but that has been formally challenged more than once because my degree is in French liter literature. So how could that be true? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. what do you have to say? Well, I think this is a great, a great point, great question. We recognize that um, the formal educational system doesn't always account for all of the capability, the talent, the raw talent uh, that we bring to bear. We also recognize that people are multi-dimensional. So while you may have a degree in, in uh, literature and English or some other degree, um, you could also have you know, very good um, innate skill around computing or around programming and, and other kinds of creative efforts. Um, the P-TECH program um, essentially um, recognizes uh, what's going on in the industry, recognizes that we truly um, need new college jobs. We need opportunity pathways uh, for people who don't always um, match uh, the profile for those who wanna go to formal um, schools. Uh, and then we, we need to catch them early uh, as we do this. So nearly a decade ago, um, IBM actually put a new face to, um, to technology, creating new pathways uh, for science, for technology, for engineering, um, really um, centering on this idea that we can have an, a new breed of um, folks uh, joining uh, the industry, taking full advantage of their capability, their innate natural capability and actually finding a pathway uh, to um, career or to vocation uh, that they love. Uh, diversity has always been important to our industry and to the technology industry specifically. And then there is more urgency now, just given uh, the movement uh, that we've seen over the last uh, number of months uh, based on some of the tragic uh, incidents. But the P-TECH program is one that IBM really founded um, quite some time ago, we made a commitment to have about 10,000 young people go through that process by 2025. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, in Ju July of this year, we actually made a commitment to have a thousand of the P-TECH uh, graduates uh, have paid uh, positions within IBM. And that number uh, will be fulfilled by 2021. Uh, we believe that this is transformational. It can be replicated. It's already been replicated. And it's something that really um, complements all of the other efforts. It's not an exclusive idea that once uh, we do P-TECH, nothing else exists. In fact, we've extended the work we've done um, working with historically black colleges and universities around quantum computing, um, along with uh, the announcements we made to establish research facility uh, with these uh, historically black colleges and universities, we also uh, donated um, hundred million dollars. Uh, and that announcement was made um, around Skills Academy, really growing skill in these new areas like quantum, like machine learning, like AI and so forth, uh, cloud mm -hmm. computing included, uh, that could actually begin to change um, the trajectory uh, for how technology really uh, drives social change. Thank you. Demetrius, on this topic, um, I think of GitHub as kind of a, a place where people can start out. You know, it's a tooling company, but also there's all that emphasis on entry. And I know a lot of people that found their way into the industry in companies like GitHub. And I'm curious if um, I know that, that you're going to take the best and brightest that you can find, but do you have specific programs to onboard people that maybe um, don't have quite the skills profile that you would normally look for if you were looking for best and brightest? Sure, so one program that we have at GitHub is called the Nurturing Program. And what that is is that if someone comes through the interview process at GitHub and we realize that they would be a great value add to our culture, but they might not have the skill set that we're looking for now, we actually place them into this Nurture Program where we will actually help upskill them 
and keep in contact with them so that when another opportunity is available, that they are then ready. Like that becomes a source of our talent pool so that we're looking to not just bring in the best and brightest talent for those that happen to see our open recs at the moment and apply, but we're actually nurturing, hence the name of the program, them along the way and making sure that quite honestly, even if the opportunity isn't at GitHub, that they'll be ready for an opportunity somewhere. Like we don't yes. take a look at diversity and inclusion and belonging as something that's unique and only should be just for GitHub itself. We want to grow the entire tech industry. We want to grow the entire open source industry. So if the opportunity is not at GitHub, we are more than happy for them to go work at Fidelity, IBM, Microsoft, any of right. the others. And so that's what we're looking to do again. Yeah, I really like that lift for everybody part of your program. I think that that's an open source value. Basically all the boats have to rise, right? And it, for open source to work. And that that makes co-opetition more valuable than competition. And, you know, the industry continues to consolidate. So so that co-opetition thing is going to become more and more important anyway. So that's great. Okay, so um, Wendy, I think of banking. I mean, I worked at PayPal, which is supposedly, a, a, you know, an edgy, sexy bank uh, as banks go, cause not so old, yep. right? And And yet I still found a lot of bankers there. <laughs> <laughs> who were risk averse and change averse and, and, you know, really, really comfortable where they were sitting. How do you change things up at a bank to, in this way? I mean, how do you, how do you approach yeah. it? Sure. Well, first off, and, and certainly no, no offense to the banks, but so we view ourselves as a financial services company, but we also have a pretty heavy technology component. So 25% um, of our firm is are in technology roles. And even here in North Carolina, where I am, 60% of our employees, um, and we have over 3,500 here, um, are in technology. So I think, you know, but it's fair to say that there are a number of industries, probably um, both the financial services and technology industries that are predominantly white and male. And so I think it takes real persistent, sustained effort and intention. Um, and so a lot of what, you know, I talk about internally and we're seeing a lot of senior leadership um, engagement with this is about being very intentional in our actions. Um, as Indu talked about, you know, being very intentional in terms of where we're recruiting and expanding the range of schools that you might recruit from. So we expanded our range of schools to include a number of, you know, of historically black colleges and universities not just the national ones that people talk about, but some that are in close proximity to us in our regions. Um, I'd say it also includes, you know, recruiting at the women's colleges as well, right? To, to, and really um, having some very specific programs that focus on women and, and, and making the financial services um, industry and roles in financial services um, more attractive to them. So again, it goes back to the intentionality of the engagement. Um, and I think in some cases, you know, where you know that there are underrepresented groups, it is okay to have targeted programs. And that's why we talk about sort of our, our bespoke programs, both in terms of recruiting, but then also for underrepresented groups when they come into the, the environment to know that they continue to be supported um, on their journey. So that's, that's what I would share. And I think they, the other real, you know, um, let's call it the business imperative aspect of that is, you know, the demographic change has happened already. Um, so the customers are continuing to become more diverse and we need to be able to, you know, produce products and services and understand our customer base. And the, the best way to do that is by having and representing um, our customers internally on our team. Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. Okay, we have a professor who has been asking, waiting to hear an answer about a question. I'm gonna read you his question because it's carefully written. Um, I'm a college professor. One of my equity issues with my, my students and I regularly discuss is the way that the tech industry prioritizes personal projects and outside of class work, teaching yourselves new languages and platforms. Students who need to work to pay their way through school or support their families are less likely to have time for personal projects. Are there ways in which the tech industry is considering those issues? 
It's a good question because this is an open source conference, and one of the things about open source is we're all we're all hot shots to learn new stuff and always be on the cutting edge. And so, um, th does anybody have anything to say about this thorny issue? I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. I remember when I was traveling a lot in India uh, at the beginning of open source and we were talking about the virtues of open source, the truth was that most people didn't have their own computers at home. And um, so asking them to do work after hours was, was a big ask, for instance. Speaking directly to the question about um, you know education, specifically in undergraduate um, institutions, we at GitHub are trying to make sure that our platform can be part of the curriculum of a lot of uh, you know colleges and universities, not just computer science that goes in the engineering programs, but in other programs as well. So we have an amazing educational organization that that's literally what they do is that they create different offerings for uh, GitHub and you know different Git and different um, technology to be embedded inside of the curriculum. Um, I actually teach, um, you know, I, I have a part-time spare time work that we all have, right? Uh, at North Carolina State University, and I teach intro to entrepreneurship to about 450 students every semester. And so now that I'm at GitHub, I'm looking at how can I incorporate our platform inside of our curriculum? Um, and it's about entrepreneurship um, because tech skills are going to be valuable for every major, not just computer science to the point that you were making earlier, Denise, about uh, your undergraduate degree and how people are questioning whether or not your computer sciences that's going to be more and more common um, as you know technology becomes more prevalent and at github we feel like our our platform is uniquely positioned to be able to introduce that inside of the educational curriculum um, there is a policy a few uh, not too long ago that was passed in india that said that technology has to be a part of the core curriculum starting in the sixth grade in India and on up until they graduate. And so this is gonna be the norm now. And so I think that if companies haven't thought about how they're going to incorporate technology um, inside of the curriculums, I think they're behind the eight ball at this point. And so to answer the professor's question, I think instead of us having the tech industry expecting students to learn it outside of the coursework, it's going to be brought inside of the coursework and i think that's going to address the issue yeah let me say that at the beginning of open source there were a lot of forward-looking college professors who had their kids bombing into existing open source programs and you know you got your grade if you could get a commit going in one of these projects and it was super disruptive to everybody summer of code was in part an answer to that but there are now starting to be schools like I know Johns Hopkins has just started an institute of applied open source and they have taken seven important software projects that they've developed internally that they're now going to open source with an eye to mentoring their own students into working on them but in the public way right and that in that way they're not trashing other people's open source projects they're pushing their own agenda but they're also giving their kids course time to work in this way that we're talking about so that's another example of somebody getting fancy about how to not disrupt people's lives too much while asking them to learn this stuff, which I think is, is really interesting. Uh, I hope that that helped you, um, Professor. We also have um, a question. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. Go All ahead. right, Denise. I was gonna say, oh. I think earlier I spoke a little bit to this about you know, it's also important to, I mean, first of all, we, we all interact with and use technology right now, right? I think every university is, is doing the same. And I think the question was around just sort of creating equity in the opportunity for all students. And so just being mindful that there are a lot of individuals, it's the same thing that comes up around lack of internships for other types of jobs. Right. And so for those individuals that are trying to you know, take on multiple jobs or have other responsibilities, they're not always able to take on internships, particularly ones that are unpaid. And it's the same potentially for the opportunity to participate in some of this other project work. And so that's where we talk about things like in the hiring process to not look for things that can be taught. So, you know, and I, and I know some may argue that maybe coding can't be taught, but I would argue that it probably can be and to look for some of the other skill sets around intellectual curiosity, 
to look about around sort of the diversity of the experience and perhaps that individual brings more to the team um, and maybe you're, you're hiring them for a different set of skills um, than, than what you might traditionally be looking at. And I just think we have to think about, you have to think more creatively in terms of who we're hiring and what we bring to the table, what's already represented on the team that maybe you don't need to over-index on that allows you the opportunity to bring a more non-traditional candidate or someone that maybe doesn't have um, all of the, you know, perfect experience set um, that right. you're, you might be looking for. Well, another another factor here is we know there's going to be a shortage of programmers going forward. So we're going to have to be looking broader, more broadly afield to find warm bodies, um, some of whom will be like me and will take to it and it'll be a career for them and others won't. Um, but it's also we have to acknowledge that it, there's a lot of hard work involved in getting ahead in this industry and and um, most of these people that are in the situation that this professors talking about are already working at full capacity just to stay above water if they're also working to me you know to earn money to maintain a family or something like that i imagine that this landscape is even more interesting in a place like africa so and what do you have to say about that i mean bringing africa into the tech sector um is as seems like it's taken a long time i i remember 10 years ago when i was at wikipedia kenya got its first really good network connection Yes, I I agree. I think it's an uneven uh, picture, um, uneven because in some places you actually have um, infrastructure that um, is quite contemporary, um, even better than what we have in the United States. Just because you know there is no um, there's no legacy in some cases. They build from scratch, and everything is high speed, and everything works. And then <laughs> I see that. And then in other places, you actually have the challenge, right? Which is a constrained environment, but that also creates opportunity because what you find is you have to write efficient coding. You have to um, adapt to the environment. You have you know, elegant code that works in many of these environments. And what I'm seeing is just a groundswell of um, of excitement about what is to come or about, you know, ways by which they solve particular, you know, problems or even create opportunity today, um, given this um, just plethora of opportunity that exists across different countries across the whole of the continent. And then the broadband connectivity that exists right through these um, submarine uh, cable systems to the rest of the world. So. Now I, I speak to young people in Africa, they see the world as their oyster. They see no limit to what innovation can do. They connect to open source communities all around the globe, right? So now you have a network of very talented, um, very passionate um, folks who can collaborate with contemporaries around the world, solving problems that they themselves have clarity around. They, these problems exist around them, the opportunity exists around them and they're able to tap into that global network of talent uh, to make change happen. That's what I see um, just uh, from a vantage point in Africa, but then understanding that um, there's connectedness and at times, um, even for me right now, I, I'm here in Africa, but it kind of feels like it doesn't really matter where, where I am, right? Because of yes, COVID-19. Yes, I feel that way. Right? right, and then I think then the difference is do we have a fidelity of understanding of the problem set? Do we have a fidelity of understanding of the opportunity space? And if we do, and technology is at our fingertips and the communities are ready to jump in with passion and ingenuity, then I think um, there is quite no, no limit. There is no limit, quite frankly, to the innovation that, are, that can occur either in Africa or the rest of the world. That's, I, I agree with you, and I am working hard to try to lift Af um, Ireland in exactly that direction as well. And sure. Ireland, as a European country, is really interesting because they're very generous about um, refugees. And so there's all these Syrian war refugees there and refugees from other, other parts of the world that have had strife that don't look like the rest of Ireland, but they're in there and they, they're fitting in and their kids are going to school. and. Um, and they're contributing to the economy in really interesting ways. And because the tech economy is so important, that's part of the scene. So how to get open source funneled into that, that education system, 
so that we turn out more collaborative workers. It's not even do they know open source, it's can they work in, a, in the open source way because I believe that's where all work is headed. I think that engineering has to head that way. Collaboration is so much more efficient. We know that now. So why wouldn't everybody cut down their silos and figure out how to get more cross-company collab cross collaboration and then interdisciplinary uh, co uh, collaboration as well? Um, so, Demetrius, we have a lot of interest about the, the diversity um, interview and what that feels like. <laughs> Got maybe five questions about it. So say a bit more about that, if you would. And, and I have to say that my diversity interview was obviously a little bit different, right? Than you know everyone else's that's coming through. But the diversity interview is meant to gauge um, every candidate's commitment and passion towards diversity, inclusion, and belonging. All those things you just spoke about, Denise. Whether or not they can be inclusive in their working styles what their experience has been working with diverse teams. Um, how is their collaboration? Will they um, facilitate an environment where all voices can be heard? And of course, that's just a baseline, right? And so as you you know, apply for managerial type roles, you're asked different levels of questions. Like, can you lead? How is your body? Not looking for anyone to be perfect, right? But making sure that they have an and, and appetite for learning, curiosity, empathy, those are some of the things that they'll be looking for. And then I can say with my own personal experience, all the things that we talked about, the fellow panelists here around, can I think about diversity and inclusion in a very wide way? Um, you know, diversity and inclusion, unfortunately, is still a very US centric topic, even though this is global opportunities, this is gonna be the way of the world. And so if you start just thinking or stop at race, gender, if you, you know, persons with disabilities, sexual orientation, there's a lot of cultural diversity and global diversity that has to be considered as well. And so yeah, we, have an, want, yeah. we have an open question about ageism, for instance. Yeah, ageism as well, generation. And so what they wanted to hear from me in my diversity interview was whether or not I can think out of the box and think differently and innovate around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. And so one of the questions in particular, so I'll, I'll give this question out, was how would I approach talent acquisition if recruiting at historically black colleges and universities and other minority serving institutions were off the table, if going to conferences and events were off the table? So anything that you could actually Google and come up with, they did not want to hear about that because those are the easy answers. And they really wanted to get into my thought process around how would we go about addressing and really, really expanding the talent pool? Because the point that you, Denise, made about the shortage in talent, it is very real. And we're going to have to start thinking about it differently if we're going to really recruit and have inside of our companies and corporations the type of diversity for the customers that we serve. And for us, the platform and the developers that we serve. Great, thank you. Wendy, um, I am entertaining a question here uh, about a report that was issued by Citibank about the cost to the US economy of um, lost opportunities because of racial inequity over the last 20 years. Apparently the, the report, which I have not read, says $16 trillion lost to the US economy alone in that. And um, I'm wondering if you're, if you're aware of that report and um, they're talking about how we could recoup 5 trillion of that by closing racial inequity gaps in employment, lending, housing, education related issues. So some of those are FinTech issues. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys looking at this report and, and what could be done? So we're very aware of, um, you know, the both Citibank, I think McKinsey has a study about the racial equity gap um, and the real opportunity there. Fidelity is very active in our work around financial literacy um, and starting that really early in schools because we do think that that is really the opportunity um, to, to teach those skill sets really early. And what we know from experience of doing this in the schools is that even though we, our focus is on the actual student, they take the skills that we provide around budgets and savings and 
you know, um, they take those back to their parents and their other family members that are in the household. So the opportunity to influence one has actually a bit of a multiplier effect. I would say that's also the focus that we bring in terms of our engagement with our customers. So Fidelity Investment um, is, may not always be known as this, but we provide, you know, we're the retirement service provider to many large corporations as well as uh, tax exempt entities. So universities and medical and, and churches and others. And so we do have a specific focus on financial wellness and really on understanding the differences in outcomes and, and starting starting point positions, right? Due to some of the historical, um, you know, biases and bias mm -hmm. in action in some, in some ways. Um, and so we are working to tailor some of our experiences around financial wellness um, to engage more of a broader, diverse community amongst our customer base. That's great. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. that you answering that question. Okay, so we're off the script just a tiny bit because I was going to ask you for your top improvements, but we got right into Q&A. Um, Q&A has, has slowed down a little bit, so um, and we're almost at the end, and I want to be... Um, aware of your time because you guys are all executives. So I think I'm going to switch to what the most important action that you think you as an executive could personally do. So this is your opportunity to make a personal statement about inclusive diversity and inclusion and equity um, in your career. It doesn't have to be the company that you work for now. So um, starting with Demetrius. Thank you, Denise. Um, personally, well, so I was leading diversity and inclusion at another open source company when um, GitHub approached me about this opportunity. And what really spoke to me about this was the way that they were trying to use their global expansion strategy and lead it with diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And so it was bigger than just GitHub and bigger than one company. It was about the entire industry across the world. And as that point you made, it was lifting everyone. And so that's what I want my personal commitment to be is actually not just focus on diversity and inclusion at GitHub, but focus on it so that we're making a difference for everyone. And we have to do that through partnerships. Um, something that I found that since I've been in this work is that companies seem to be doing their own thing a lot. Everybody's working to solve the same thing. And there isn't a lot of that cooperation as you talked about. Denise. Yeah. And so if I wanted to have a personal charge, and I'm so grateful for GitHub for giving me the platform to do that, is really focus on that and open sourcing diversity and inclusion, if I could be a little tongue in cheek about it. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, Endu. I'll say um, three things. Um, as an IBM fellow, I hope um, that the work that I do um, inspires uh, the current uh, generation as well as uh, future generations to come. Um, and then specifically, um, over the last um, number of months, uh, we've within IBM been driving a call for code for racial justice. We, we made the announcement to that keynote. Um, this has been truly a profound uh, process. Um, a profound, transparent uh, process where we've engaged uh, the Black community within IBM. We've um, captured the essence of the fears, the frustrations, um, the exhaustion, um, the hope, uh, the aspirations of this uh, community. Um, we had um, more than 500 IBMers and Red Hatters uh, really participate, walk shoulder to shoulder to uh, formed the nucleus of the work that we did. And then we expanded the view uh, much beyond the Black community uh, to IBMers around the world, uh, really to participate, give us their best thoughts, uh, their best ideas, show up with their whole selves uh, to really define uh, these solution starters that we made announcements for uh, today. Uh, we made announcements of five of them. This is just the beginning. Uh, we'll continue to release these to the open community we believe uh, that if we can have this passionate community around the world, galvanize, accelerate, and then bring the, the best thinking they can around these kinds of solutions. And this can become enduring. Uh, this can be sustained. I don't have to be in the middle of this, nor Dale or others uh, who are part of the leadership um, that uh, created the nucleus of what I'm describing. So my whole personal hope is 
that we can actually have um, change happen driven by the power of open, uh, driven by the power of open source communities, the talent, the passion, the ingenuity that everybody brings to this. That would be my hope. And then lastly, what I would say is, you know, really um, having this kind of community, this kind of conversation uh, for me is a big win. Uh, knowing that diversity and inclusion is good business. Uh, there is abundant evidence that this is true. Wendy already alluded to this, Dimitri already said this. This is good business, should be intrinsic uh, to how uh, we work, how we uh, do business. We must shift gears very quickly, go from unconscious bias to conscious inclusion. We have to go from being color blind to being color appreciative. And then we have to go from passive non-discrimination to active allyship. And I'm hoping that through the work we're doing, uh, we can get to that place where this becomes natural and intrinsic, just happens as a matter of course, rather than something we got to think about too, um, uh, too deeply. Thanks very much again. Thank you. When did you get the anchor spot? Sure, well, thank you so much. Um, I think in terms of the biggest you know, actions that I can take personally, I would say that it started over 90 days ago when I stepped into and agreed to take on this role. And I think, uh, you know, for me, I, like I mentioned, I've been at Fidelity for over 20 years in various business leadership roles um, and perhaps deliberately avoiding diversity and inclusion as a, as a role, although I had been doing diversity and inclusion work off the side of my desk, right? I'd been involved in the formation of many of our employee resource groups. I had been mentoring and advocating and sponsoring other associates across the spectrum, not just people of color. Um, I had also, as you talked about, been an ally. Um, and I hear now we're calling that an accomplice. Mm. So I definitely have been familiar already with utilizing your own political and brand capital to benefit others. But I think in, in terms of, you know, the, we just have a little bit more of, a, of an urgency right now, if you, if you feel like. Um, around diversity and inclusion. And it goes beyond sort of the business imperative that we've been talking about. And I felt like, you know, um, felt a little bit of, if not now, then when? If not me, then who? And so I would say that what I've learned in the first 90 days in the world, which is actually tomorrow, um, is that there's such tremendous enthusiasm around um, diversity and inclusion how to keep the momentum going, that there's actually the temptation to take on too much and to try to do too much. And so I'm leaning in a little bit in terms of learning to say no, to be really intentional, like I said before, and think about what actions might be that are really gonna move the dial and that are not just performative in, in intent, right? And in execution that are really going to make a difference. And so that's what I would say is sort of the biggest action that I personally can take. And I think if I'm leading that effort from, from, the, from the top, um, along with our, our leaders and CEO, that others will follow. Um, and so it is all that Endu and Dimitri spoke about. Um, but I think all of us, and this is what we believe at Fidelity, we're all accountable. So we all mm -hmm. have to make this personal. And what many have heard me say at Fidelity is that this is hard work, which makes it hard work. Right. Okay. So in closing, I would like to acknowledge that in almost none of the conversations that we've had so far this morning, have we talked at all about transgender people um, or about, about homosexual people because we're not getting to it. We're focused on a different group. But I want to say that I watched Elizabeth Birch, who was a prominent lawyer at Apple, single-handedly create domestic partnership through direct advocacy from her desk at Apple and knowing the whole time that Apple wasn't necessarily condoning what she was doing it was before Tim Cook, right, before Steve came back, but she did it anyway. And a lot of times this comes down to personal executive uh, risk. You know, people think you get to the executive level and you're done risking in your career, you're just gonna get the big bucks, but there's still an opportunity to show up and push the needle forward. 
And, um, and I really applaud the three of you for participating today and for taking all those questions from the audience and um, you know, representing your companies well, but also the imperative that we need these companies to show up to really create this change. We have to meet in the middle between the people out in the streets that are showing up, those, those moms in Portland, my God, you know, all the people showing up have to also have air cover from the money or nothing changes. So thank you for representing within your companies an effort to push the money forward for good business reasons, but also because it is the right humanitarian thing to do at this time. So thank you so much.